very glad to see you here and uh, welcome you to the third lecture of this year, Open Lecture Series, organized by Faculty of Architecture of Estonian Academy of Arts and supported by Cultural Endowment of Estonia. And today's lecture is again organized in collaboration with the Museum of Estonia, Architecture Museum, and it's part of the Future Architecture Program which introduces and celebrates innovation, experimentation, and the idea of a generation that will design the architecture and build Arab cities in the years to come, but already now as well. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Levente Poyak. Levente is an urban planner, researcher, community advocate, and policy advisor. After studying architecture at Budapest University of Technology, Urbanism at the Institut d'Urbanisme de Paris, and Sociology at ELTE Budapest, and the School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris, he was visiting lecturer at the Mohalinaji University of Art and Design, the Budapest University of Technology, and Technical University of Wien. Uh, he was also visiting fellow at Columbia University and the École Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture Paris Marquet and holds a PhD in sociology from the Central Euro European University. He has worked on urban regeneration projects for the cities like New York, Paris uh, and Rome and also worked for Tartu. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> it's nice to just to put it up the road in Tartu. Uh, in 2012 and 13, he was advisor to the head of urban planning in Budapest and contributing editor of the Budapest 2030 Urban Development Strategy. He's editor of Cooperative City, co-founder of Eutropian Research and Action, and member of the KEK, which means Hungarian Contemporary Architecture Center in Budapest. Currently, currently, he is serving as a consultant to the Citizens Dialogue Series of the European Investment Bank and Committee of Regions. His recent books include Vacant City, Experiments and Inclusive Urban Regeneration uh, 2015, and, for example, Funding and Compa Cooperative City, Community Finance, and the Economy of City Spaces, 2017. Please join me welcoming Levent Thank you. I think he was a bit exaggerated. <laughs> I should have sent a, a shorter version. But anyway, um, just a little bit to understand who you, who you are. Uh, how many of you are architects? OK. <laughs> not everybody. <laughs> Big comments. Not everybody. But architects and architecture students. Okay. okay. Uh, social scientists. Economists. Urban planners. Okay. Not too bad. So it means that there are no economists to check uh, if what I'm saying is correct. But I hope uh, some of the ideas will be also. Or, uh, in, invite a bit of criticism also from your side. And we have still a lot of uh, spaces here. Three VIP seats in the first row. And here. And so you should. Uh, also, I mean, if you want to sit here as well. And there is another. Hey guys, come here. Still a lot of spaces, and uh, I give you five seconds to choose your space, and then we can start. Maybe before before we go ahead, maybe I, I need to say a few words uh, about the Future Architecture Platform. That is, uh, I think it's a joint program of many architecture institutions in Europe, and I think it's a very interesting attempt to connect uh, museums, architecture centers, all kinds of uh, uh, architecture-related institutions to bring together 
ideas and also create a platform for young practitioners, emerging architects, and people like me. Who I'm, I'm not necessarily an architect anymore. I'm not emerging either, but somehow I found my way into the, the platform. What I'm going to talk about uh, now is uh, is a book we published a year ago. I will leave a copy here for. Uh, for your library and it's, it's also online the whole thing and I will tell a little bit why we started to look into these topics because I understand that you are you know predominantly architects you work with design you work with uh, how to shape spaces but I would like to invite you now for a, a half an hour or maybe an hour at max to think a little bit about what is beyond beyond design uh, and even what is beyond planning how do we uh, how can we uh, conceive buildings as, let's say, uh, instruments of power, uh, instruments of uh, equality or unequality, and how can we plan with the long term uh, with buildings in a way that is not necessarily architectural but is very connected to what architects uh, can do. But a little bit just for the context, I think you're all aware of uh, you know, the whole architecture, all how architecture has been uh, mobilized in the last uh, decade for, uh, for all kinds of speculative things. This is the skyline of, of London. Uh, most of these buildings will never be used as housing, although they are built as housing, or uh, some of them are as offices, but there's a lot of uh, architecture that is built only uh, practically as physical materialization of stock, uh, you know, stocks, but nobody's going to live there. It's just to buy and to sell for higher profit. This is creating, of course, a very uh, crucial, very deep housing crisis. Now, we also see that uh, in the context not so far as London, but maybe in Warsaw, you see also how this kind of architecture creates a lot of pressure on the real estate market. And even uh, maybe some of you are familiar with, uh, with how uh, uh, reprivatization issues in Warsaw, for example, redraw completely ownership patterns and create, again, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, social conflicts. We also see that in many cases, architecture uh, maybe unwillingly, but becomes also a tool of uh, over-tourism and uh, gentrification, and it also, again, puts a lot of pressure on, on communities. Now, you could say that this is all beyond the architecture, beyond the design, and you do your job, and then, you know, what happens with the building is not your issue anymore. But there are a lot of architects in Europe that are working uh, somehow differently, and maybe I would like to show you a little bit what can architects do or architects and non-architects together in order to create a bit uh, you know, more accessible, more sustainable, more egalitarian architecture. Um, for example, they can help creating uh, access to, to buildings, uh, existing spaces. I will tell a little bit more in details, but in Budapest, for example, for years, we, we were running a program to open for NGOs unused spaces. In Riga, I know many of you are from Riga, uh, there's, uh, there's been a lot of effort to put into what to do with empty spaces. And I also saw here the architecture competition has a lot of reuses of empty spaces. This is sometimes not seen as the prime architectural uh, issue. It is, I think, a very important architectural issue, not only to redesign these buildings, but also to organize access and organize new uses. Uh, this is a community garden we run in Budapest with my architecture uh, foundation, again, because we realize that uh, you know, open spaces uh, can bring together the community, can bring a lot of knowledge about, uh, you know, about uh, green space, about even urban agriculture, things that don't seem to be directly architectural, but actually they are a way of shaping the urban environment. Also, uh, we are involved in different cities uh, protecting community spaces and developing a bit models for them. Uh, I'm just running through a few aspects uh, of, of what can architects do. So this is one of the issues also architects can do to develop strategies to, to save, uh, maintain, safeguard community spaces. Of course, also architects can work on building connections. This is the uh, Gebitz Betrayung office in, uh, in Vienna, which is kind of an organization mostly run by architects that uh, serves the neighborhood with all kinds of information that is related to buildings, spaces, access to spaces again uh, and again. Another important issue that I will talk very much in details about is uh, architects and architectural strategies can help move uh, properties out of speculation, out of the, the speculation market. I'm not going into details now because it's going to be one of the, the focuses of the, the talk. 
Also, architects can be very much involved in uh, designing new models of ownership, and uh, like in the famous case of uh, uh, Granby Four Streets Community Land Trust in Liverpool, which became very famous because of the involvement of Assemble, you know, the famous London architecture collective. Also, architects are very involved in designing new models of governance, meaning that how a space is organized, how decisions are made, how resources are coordinated. Because again, this is very, a very important dimension of how a building survives and, and goes on. Or, uh, as in many cases, for example, here in, in Rotterdam, they can uh, be also they can put buildings in the middle, uh, in the center of economic circuits. You can help a building to absorb some of the economic flows in a, in, a, in a given neighborhood. Now, you know, you can do all these things or at least be a bit more aware of how these processes work. And I think this is something that we, or architecture schools and all kinds of institutions often forget to tell their students, but buildings and uh, urban environments have a, an economic life and this is a very important part of, uh, of buildings. Now, a little bit about who, who I am and who we are. Be, beyond this name-dropping introduction that uh, was a bit uh, too much, uh, maybe more actual to say that I, I work in an organization that is called Eutopian, that is based in uh, Rome as an association and, and in Vienna as a company. We work with two identities because, because uh, in the world of community organizations, we are taken seriously if we are, uh, or we are trusted if we are an association. We're not trusted if, if we're a company. And in the world of municipalities and, and private actors, we are taken seriously uh, if we're a company. It's a very, very banal thing, but this is how things work, that you, you have to approach your client sometimes in an identity that uh, that client actually can relate to. So we work with, uh, with, uh, with this organization, we work with very similar things uh, with the company and with the association. One of the things we do is ad advocacy. So we work, for example, a lot on building local networks of, of uh, civic society. This is something, again, you think it's not necessarily architectural, but you will see how much it is part of a, a building, let's say, an urban planning strategy for a given neighborhood, also with very important architectural elements. We work a lot uh, also on bringing together organizations from across Europe, focusing on one topic. Uh, for example, here we are in Budapest in our gallery space uh, with uh, architects and urbanists and uh, you know, civic developers from 15 countries looking into non-speculative ways of, of urban development. So this is something, uh, this is a workshop we did two years ago and this was one of the bases again for the book uh, that we published later on. And also on another level, in order to survive, uh, we work a lot with municipalities. So this is how we also work with uh, Tartu municipality. We don't, ah yes, we have, he's from Tartu. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we work a little, uh, with municipalities in international networks to, for, ex for knowledge exchange, uh, sometimes with a uh, little bit architectural dimension, sometimes with less architectural dimension. But this is something that is for us very important to understand how municipalities can actually work with civil society, how can we help them to better communicate with different uh, urban stakeholders. And sometimes we help in for, uh, this is what you mentioned, uh, with, with uh, European institutions, because we also understand that there's a lot of activities on the ground. Uh, European institutions are very far from, from all this, and it's very important to make many of these initiatives, many of the, the logics of how cities are made more accessible, more sustainable. It's very important to make these, uh, these uh, initiatives much more visible on the European level. Now, this is on the advocacy side. But we also work a lot on uh, implementation. For example, I mentioned this program that we run for, for years, uh, opening access to, to spaces. Uh, between 2012 and 16, we opened about uh, 12 different spaces in Budapest. This is, for example, a, a sustainable mobility hub where there's a lot of organizations working with cargo bags and all kinds of things. We help them find the space, we help them negotiate with the owner, renovate the, the building and, and use this as a, as a long-term uh, solution for the needs. We had a lot of other organizations we uh, helped uh, into spaces. We organized regularly festivals, like uh, this was a festival called Festival of Open Shops, where we uh, convinced private and public owners who couldn't really rent out the spaces for years to open it up for one month. Let's try, what does it mean to bring in a neighborhood a lot of activities, 
uh, let's have them, you know, come to a common denominator and let's have a long-term relationship between an owner and a potential user. Again, this is not directly architectural, but this is something that you organize resources, uh, unused spatial resources, and a lot of people, clients that want uh, these spaces, and this is, I think, a very important uh, job to do in, in our cities. And in Rome, we spent some years uh, rethinking a little bit market halls, which we understood that they are decaying uh, because of very bad regulations, because of, uh, you know, uh, uh, not understanding really what are the needs today for the, on the market. So to help uh, food markets to rethink themselves, start working more as, a, as a, on the one hand, you know, food markets, but also a place where you can eat, also recycling hubs, also hubs for uh, uh, social entrepreneurship, etc., etc. all new functions that you can plug into uh, an existing building. And I think thinking about uh, public infrastructure that is losing a little bit its, its meaning, its functions, like uh, food markets in, in uh, many parts of of Europe, or libraries, or you know, post offices, or railway stations. This is a big challenge for, for or bridges. We see a lot of bridges at, at the exhibition. That says so there's a lot of public infrastructure that is no longer uh, needed in the form it is, and we have to rethink them and give new functions to them. Now, all these activities uh, helped us a little bit to look into what is a civic space. We were trying to define how in many parts of Europe, maybe not in the Baltic states so far, and not in Scandinavia either, but big parts of uh, Northwest, West, South, Southeast Europe, uh, we saw that uh, in many, for many reasons, because of uh, austerity policies, because of uh, you know, political transformation, many urban functions, many welfare functions were actually gradually taken over by civic initiatives. Uh, if you go to Athens, if you went to Athens five years ago, it's of course an extreme case. You found entire hospitals running on volunteer uh, contribution. You go to Italy, uh, many cities you find you know, a lot of schools, a lot of theaters, cinemas run by civic initiatives, often informally, even uh, very often occupied, so illegally. So there's a lot of need that's coming from the civic society to fill the gaps of the welfare society. In Europe, in Northwest Europe, it's it's less about occupations today. It's much more about outsourcing. Municipalities are outsourcing many of the functions. Uh, for example, healthcare. A big part of healthcare would be actually given over to uh, NGOs or, or even uh, social enterprises. Again, this is that doesn't look like an architectural problem. But if you look at how these cities uh, will be organized, how this or the traditional spaces for healthcare or for education or for culture are actually reorganized and, and maybe they find actually new locations and may, very often they're run by uh, you know, more unstructured organizations. This is becoming an architectural issue as well. So we started to look into uh, conditions of access for all these uh, civic initiatives, all these citizen projects. Uh, how do they have access to spaces? What kind of relationships do they build up with, uh, with the public sector, with the private sector? What kind of legal frameworks assure for them long-term uh, uh, situation? How do they access capital? Because very often, you know, uh, when we work, for example, with, with different organizations, okay, it's one thing we can open the space, but uh, how, do you, how do you renovate this? No, often you have to put in uh, thousands, tens of thousands of euros. How do you find the money for this? And also, very often, actually, something that uh, I should have mentioned before, we see that many uh, initiatives uh, that happen by just having access to some space, they put a lot of energy into these spaces, they create a lot of value, and, and this value actually is materialized on the real estate side, on the real estate owner's side. The initiatives, after a while, they are kicked out, and then you know the real estate gained a lot of value, and a very standard development goes on. So this is what we see in many places that uh, in the years of crisis, all civic projects, all people who bottom up, you know, they could rethink an industrial area, uh, a former public infrastructure. They put in a lot of energy, they brought a lot of people in there, they gave visibility, they created a lot of value. This value was actually not, uh, not extracted by them, but it was extracted by, by owners. So the question is, how can you create a long-term presence? How can you assure your situation for the long term. 
So in this process, we <coughs> went to a lot of cities. We, we did not come so much in, uh, not, uh, in Scandinavia and the Baltic states, but it's never too late. Uh, we went to a lot of places, we did a lot of interviews, we did a lot of workshops to understand a little bit what are the common issues, what are the issues that are relevant for, for all organizations or many organizations across Europe. And we also realized that uh, when we talk about citizen-run uh, spaces or community-run spaces, it's not anymore only like a, a small cultural center, it's not anymore uh, like a little educational club. Uh, it's a lot of different functions. It's functions for production, functions for tourism, functions for housing, of course, uh, for work, for all kinds of exchange, commerce. Uh, so in the end, you can actually build a whole city out of this kind of, uh, kind of uh, citizen-run project. This is why we started to call this whole project the Cooperative City, because we realized that actually you can, you can create almost all kinds of things. You, know, you cannot build railways. Uh, you cannot build subways, but a lot of urban functions you can build based on community-led projects. Now, this is what brought us to this book, uh, that is a little bit of a summary of some parts, but of course there's been a lot of developments also in the last one year. But particularly in the next uh, maybe half an hour, I would like to speak uh, about <coughs> new models of ownership, new models of community finance, uh, uh, local economy and governance. This, again, might sound like not very architectural, but I will try to show you what is the, the connection. Now, um, one of the big issues is, is uh, as I mentioned, is speculation. A lot of uh, real estate is bought only to be resold or to uh, you know, keep money safe for a while and then not really for using. So it's been a big thing in, in, in many cities. Also, we saw that uh, uh, a lot of the citizen initiatives, the citizen-led regeneration projects have been actually in a way hijacked by uh, professional real estate interests and not necessarily the, the initiatives themselves or the community that contributed to this. And this is why I think it's a very interesting to look into a, a Berlin example, the ex print. How many of you are familiar with, with Berlin situation in general? Okay, some people. I know it's a very weird question, what is the Berlin situation? <laughs> no? I think it's mostly a big, uh, what I mean by the Berlin situation in this aspect is a, you know, a city that went almost bankrupt in the mid-2000s, uh, actually five years earlier than all the other cities, uh, had to sell everything, uh, so it was actually a very, very quick, very forced privatization of all public assets. And, uh, and then it's, in a way, found back its uh, economic dynamic, and now it's buying back the buildings that it was selling 10 years ago, just uh, everything costs four times more today than 10 years ago. So it's a, it was a bit of a, a complicated moment. How many of you are si uh, familiar with the extra to print itself? Okay, great. We have one person. So I'm sorry for boring you, but I think it's a very interesting uh, case because this is, this was the first example in, in Berlin where a community of tenants, mostly artists actually, they managed to buy their own buildings uh, uh, in order to assure their, their long-term presence. So what happened is that uh, mid-2000s cities started to sell all the properties. A big Icelandic uh, uh, developer came. They wanted to buy you know, in a big package a lot of, uh, lot of different uh, properties and this 10,000 square meter complex in Wedding, which is northwest of Berlin. Now it's quite central. It was at the time it was actually quite peripheral in terms of cultural activities. So the city uh, was about to sell this, but then the crisis came and uh, the, the, the developer disappeared. And uh, there was this you know, community of tenants, which included a lot of artists, but a lot of people who work with wood. I chose this picture because you have the people who work with the wood over there. Also, uh, they come from a German class. They're uh, clearly recently arrived uh, uh, refugees. Uh, and then you have a lot of institutional things, you know, like uh, flags of bigger companies, and cars, people who work with cars. It's not only, you know, not only hippies uh, using these offices. So it was a mixed community of tenants. And they decided that, uh, you know, we, they actually started to play with the idea we could become, become a, we could become owners of this, this building. What happens is that they realize that there's uh, been already 
uh, in work a few foundations in Germany and Switzerland that are working on taking properties off the speculation. Here we are with the workshop uh, four years ago actually uh, interviewing some of the, the people from the Exotoprin. What happens is that they created, this, these foundations created the mechanism uh, in which they come, they buy the, the, the land underneath the building, they help the organization or the, the collective to buy the building, with, they help with the, the bank loan. Uh, and this, the fact of this shared ownership, it excludes in the long term uh, selling, selling the properties, so it is excluding speculation. Why is it important? Because this community, when they started to look into buying the building, of course they never did anything like that, they were a bunch of artists, uh, that never really dealt with 10,000 square meter uh, properties. Uh, but they started to build up their knowledge of how, how to, well, they knew how to manage the building, they knew all the tenants, they knew how much it cost, they knew the realities of the, the building. And they started to look into uh, financial partners, etc., etc., and they realized that this is a, this is a moment when um, they could actually make a lot of money if they buy the building now and in 10 years they sell the building. And now, in this moment came a very idealistic, uh, uh, maybe ideological moment when they realized that this whole idea of uh, creating, making a lot of money with this thing, it started to ruin completely their community dynamic and everybody started to look into their own private profits. Uh, and instead they started to look into uh, possibilities to safeguard the building for themselves, for the use. Uh, but excluding the idea of private profit uh, from the whole picture. This is how they found these foundations. And uh, uh, this constellation of sharing the ownership with another owner, which was actually created to, uh, well, these foundations are uh, created in order to exclude speculation. So this land in this building will never again be sold uh, in the next 99 years for, for sure. So this is uh, creating an island uh, out of speculation, which means that those prices that were quite normal uh, maybe seven, eight years ago when this space started to operate, now they are considered very cheap <coughs> in the urban context because all the rest of the, the city was actually always, you know, all the properties resold, 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 uh, raising rents, uh, except for this one and some others uh, be because there's no reason for them to raise their, their own prices, except if, you know, maintenance costs or energy costs would one day uh, raise, but in this case they created an island of affordability. Now, another important thing is that most of the money that comes in, because the organization rents this land, it's like paying a bank loan, but it doesn't end in, in 20 years, but there's a sustainable economic model for that. So they, they pay a monthly or yearly fee to these foundations for the land. This goes into a solidarity fund uh, that helps to buy other community spaces for communities. So this means that now in Berlin, we already talk about, uh, about 30 or 40 buildings that were bought with the help of these kind of solidarity funds and that are managed by communities and that are forever excluded from, from, from speculation. This is the same idea somewhere like uh, the community land trust model, which comes from the US and uh, it comes especially from an area where, uh, uh, I think Burlington, where uh, maybe you know Bernie Sanders, he was the mayor in this, this town and he was very much promoting the idea of community land trust. Community land trust again is a kind of a, a, a constellation in which the land is in community ownership. And the buildings can be either in community ownership or can be in individual ownership. But you, uh, if you buy, let's say you buy an apartment for let's say 100,000 pounds, which you don't, but let's say, uh, in five years you cannot buy it, you cannot sell it for 200,000 pounds, you can only sell it in a controlled way, maybe you can add the inflation, but it is all controlled because the community ownership of land can put this kind of rules on how uh, buildings or properties are sold. So the whole idea is a long-term affordability, of course not everything is privately owned on the land either, but many of, of the, the units are, you know, affordable rent or community spaces or, or, or different kinds of spaces. And the point is that this kind of shared ownership excludes uh, arbitrary speculation with, with the property. And this has been a very important tool uh, uh, in many places in Europe and the whole community land trust movement from the UK is actually right now moving to Europe. We already have, uh, maybe I have a photo. We are, yeah, oh yeah, sorry. 
So this is, for example, the, 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 the Liverpool Community Land Trust I mentioned, where Assemble has had a very important part in uh, well, designing the spaces, but also designing the whole uh, neighborhood dynamics. Or in Brussels, we have new buildings uh, that are uh, built in the Community Land Trust models. We have many projects right now in Europe that are trying to implement the Community Land Trust model in, in France, in Holland, in Germany, in other places. I'm just saying this because it's, uh, it seems to be a, a very, uh, very inspiring new model uh, exactly to solve the biggest problem related to, uh, related to our cities is housing affordability and, and in general affordability of spaces. I don't know about the Tallinn situation in terms of real estate. Maybe you tell me that it's completely affordable. Uh, there's, you know, housing is a human right. In most constitutions in Europe, <laughs> housing is a human right, and of course it doesn't mean anything because uh, in most places it's just completely unaffordable. And of course there are also many other dynamics which are, which are based about community ownership, like uh, in small towns in France, we can see some movements that, uh, for example, there's a neighborhood uh, which has a lot of empty shops, and uh, you know, the community comes together and they start buying up those shops together because if I have 1,000 euro, I cannot buy anything. But if I have uh, 2,000 neighbors and they all put in 1,000 euros, then we have 2 million euros, and then we can already buy quite a few things for 2 million euros, and even for 100,000 euros. So this is an idea of let's create a community ownership of, of these assets which are important for our neighborhood. Uh, let's uh, rent them out for associations or organizations which have a positive impact on the neighborhood. So in this case, we can actually influence our neighborhoods better. And here we come to the whole idea of uh, uh, community finance and ethical finance. No? The question of how do, we, how do we gather money in a different way. Traditionally in urban development, of course, you have a big bank that uh, gives you uh, a, a loan with very, well, you know, depending on the conditions, different kinds of interests. Uh, the developer makes uh, 20% profit on the whole thing. This is how the whole project is feasible. Here we talk about what if a community is trying to get uh, some money for these kinds of uh, projects and how can, you, how can you do this? I mentioned you about uh, how these foundations uh, work in, with the separation of the ownership of the land, uh, you know, uh, using the, co the, 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 uh, the uh, this, uh, solidarity fund to reinvest into similar spaces. So this is this is one model that we see spreading a lot. For example, this is an area in Neukölln, Berlin, where a whole big area was actually bought uh, by one of these foundations, and it is investing into a lot of community and activities on this site. But it's not only Germany; it's a lot of other places. For example, probably you're aware of the whole Barcelona transformation with. Uh, with the Barcelona and Comu and uh, with a very progressive, very participatory uh, city government. But again, Barcelona has only 3% of public housing. Uh, it's kind of more or less the, the Budapest proportion, which is you know 3% of public uh, housing. It's very low, very high individual ownership or institutional ownership. You know, uh, the whole uh, process of a lot of foreclosures in the last years. So a big problem with affordable housing. No? Also tourism, I mean, if you follow the news, some, some European cities are completely uh, sinking because of tourism and there's no more affordable housing for, 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 for locals. Now, the Barcelona municipality has no lot of money available for building new housing, but it has some land. So one of the new constructions that uh, Barcelona is working with is making the land available as a public competition. One of the actors that comes in is an architect, but also you need a financial organization, you need a, a developer, you need a community. Very often uh, it's a requirement to have a, a social project related to this. And then, uh, then uh, you can make a bid and then you can, you can develop, you can get a long-term lease on the land, which is like uh, 25 or 50 years. You don't own the land, but you have a long-term presence, so you, cannot, you, know, you can use this uh, uh, land for... Uh, uh, you can be sure that your building will be there for a few decades. And then, uh, then you need some money to, to raise, no? And this is something that's quite interesting. One of this, uh, the first uh, social housing that was built this way, La Borda, was uh, created in a way that uh, a financial cooperative that is called COP57, we also have them in this book, 
they um, started a big crowdfunding campaign. Crowdfunding, often we have the idea that uh, I want to publish a book and I need, uh, uh, I, I, I need maybe, uh, let's say, 500 people to give me uh, 10 euros and then I can publish a book and then I, they get back a, a book. But there's another uh, type of crowdfunding which is called investing where I, in this case, uh, if I have 1,000 euro, I give them 1,000 euros. Uh, they pay me back every year, they pay me back 2% uh, of interest, which is already better than if I keep my money in the bank. And after three years, I get back the, the, the original money. No? So I make, with my 1,000 euro, I make uh, 20, year, 20 euros per year, I make 60 euros in, in three years, but I'm part of a very interesting process. And uh, with this process, actually, in two weeks, uh, 800,000 euros were raised, which were covering the missing part of the funding, this whole uh, process. Why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because also I think the best of uh, architecture innovation in Barcelona and in Spanish cities are all going into this uh, this field. It's uh, I don't know exactly the name of the architects who were doing this, but uh, I met them. I forget their names. I, I see a lot of architectural activism, a lot of architectural innovation going into these processes because you do something where you you are. Uh, it's 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 a new prestige. Like in 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 France, you know. Social housing or public housing was very big prestige. A lot of big architects were putting their energy into public housing uh, because because somehow the public realm had its own prestige. In, in in Spain, this is a very important field now. A lot of people are innovating in architecture in order to help the public good, the public infrastructure, affordable housing, which is the biggest issue. And also, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of organizations that are building up these kind of final mechanisms in order to, uh, in order to, uh, in order to, uh, to, you know, make possible this long-term, uh, long-term public infrastructure to exist. Now, another dimension uh, is uh, more less the financial, less the question of how do we find the money to build a project. Uh, but more, how do we, how can we use buildings to actually channel some of the money circulating in our cities into uh, into short socially uh, valuable things? No, because uh, we see that uh, uh, a lot of formats, there's a lot of money circulating. For example, in tourism, uh, most of the money goes into uh, a few owners, a few property owners, and Airbnb in California. So where is all this tourist money? Where does this all? come into local economy? This is one of the, the big questions. Now, a group of architects in Rotterdam, uh, studying the MAC, uh, they realized that uh, on the one hand, there's a lot of empty buildings uh, in their favorite neighborhoods, central Rotterdam, where they were already active. They knew the community. They were very present. Um, and also, there's a lot of need for, again, affordable housing, community spaces. So they went to the owners uh, of these houses, of this, uh, well, they identified six buildings in, in a very central area which were not really uh, in any plans for redevelopment. And, uh, and they approached this uh, public owner, it's actually a housing corporation, publicly owned housing corporation, so it acts as a company, but it's publicly owned, but it can make faster decisions than usually a, a public administration. Mm -hmm. So they said that, uh, look, you have these six buildings, uh, these buildings will cost you uh, about 60,000 euros in the next 10 years, uh, even if you don't do anything with them, because this is the basic uh, cost of checking them, you know, uh, uh, minimal maintenance, minimal uh, guarding. So this is going to be the cost for the next uh, years. Because I think it's also important for architects to know that uh, all unused buildings cost a lot of money. And uh, just a side uh, uh, comment that uh, we, we were quite uh, into understanding this in, in, in Budapest, we understood that some districts uh, spend about 3 million euros a year just uh, in, we talk about one small district, 3 million euros a year to pay the, the, the common uh, communality costs for some basements, some shops and some empty apartments. No? So this is 3 million euros that doesn't, is not even going into maintenance, it is going actually into, into the black hole. This is an inevitable cost. Except that every municipality has two pockets. In one pocket is uh, I make decisions and I, I need the council to make decisions about 10,000 euros. And this is my pocket that is the inevitable cost. And I can, 
I can lose 3 million euros with no problem and nobody's going to know, nobody's going to be sad about it, no? So there are these anomalies in, in, in terms of uh, public budgets. The important thing is that what they offered, uh, studying the MAC in Rotterdam, what they offered to this uh, housing uh, uh, corporation is that uh, we, you know, we know that this is going to be your cost. Why don't we take this money up front as an investment money instead of, uh, instead of, uh, of uh, taking it as a loss? Why don't, why don't you give us the 60,000 euro? We take these 60,000 euros to renovate these six buildings. Of course, we will put a lot of energy uh, of our own, uh, but we will create, uh, you know, spaces that can be used for housing and also for uh, a lot of, uh, you know, community work. And this is going to cost you exactly the same thing as otherwise it would have costed, except that we create a lot of community value. And I think this is a very important thing because this means that a group of architects understand a little bit how do public budgets function. They make one step towards becoming. Uh, actually the developers, uh, understanding a little bit what is behind, but also understanding how renovation works, how can we mobilize uh, you know, our own labor in order to make it uh, feasible, and also maybe eventually how can we exchange labor for uh, different kinds of uh, local services or, or, or uh, possibilities. So I think it's a very interesting and very successful project. And of course now, after a few years that it's all, uh, you know, everything was renovated, they're all using the spaces, and now they're in the next step of understanding how could they kind of create a long-term uh, presence, how could they join the ownership of these spaces so that they're not kicked out when the 10 years is over. Another thing, and maybe I'm not going to go into details because maybe this is the example that is farthest from, from you, uh, but I think it's quite interesting because it's it's about um, it's a it's a project in again in Rotterdam initiated by an artist who is very much uh, Jean van Heyswijk who's very much very much into understanding uh, local dynamics how communities work understanding skills uh, and uh, and they realize that there's this whole neighborhood called Afrikaanderwijk it's uh, very complicated it's uh, there's a lot of unemployment low education rate. Uh, there's a big migrant population, and there's a lot of people, especially migrant women, who work at home. Well, they don't work; they're at home. Uh, they are very isolated. You know, they're uh, you know they never learn Dutch, uh, uh, but they have a lot of skills. They have they have a lot of knowledge that they have never really used on the market. They only use it at home. It's for sewing, it's for cooking, it's all kinds of things uh, that actually are could be very competitive in, 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 in the market. So what they did is that they started to well, all organize around a set of spaces. So they identified a few areas in, in uh, this neighborhood. Uh, they went to visit a lot of people. They started to understand, map the skills. What are the skills, the unused skills in this, in this neighborhood? How can we connect them together? If there's a lot of people, a lot of women who are very skilled in sewing, we can make a cooperative out of them. We can create one you know, umbrella organization. Uh, one person, for one person, it's very difficult to enter the market. I need an accountant. I need a, you know, a tax advisor. I need a, you know, a lawyer. It's a lot of, lot of things I need. If we are a group, my personal threshold is much lower because, because you know, this is done uh, together. So now uh, many of these uh, women are uh, in this cooperative, they work for Paris-based fashion houses because their skills are actually used in a proper way. Others like here, uh, they're created uh, uh, food cooperatives, uh, catering companies, etc. Et Why is it important? For me, it's, I think it's very important because this was a way of understanding on the one hand what are the skills in the neighborhood, what are the needs in the neighborhood, what are the spaces in the neighborhood that can accommodate so it's a social kitchen or another workshop, what are the spaces in the neighborhood that could actually help in the aggregation bringing together all the skills in order to you know, jump uh, skills. Or another example in, in within this one, and this one is one of the cities which is really under pressure from tourism and gentrification, also it was uh, under pressure from the crisis and austerity, and a group of uh, uh, architects and cultural producers, the architects are called the uh, Atelier Mob, maybe you know them, they are very much into designing for people who cannot afford, uh, so designing, they call it designing for the 99%. So they were, they've been working a lot after the fire, for example, the big fire of last year. They were very much involved in you know, rebuilding the, the areas which were affected by the fire. 
And, and uh, before that, they, they founded this building. So they created a, a, this uh, building that they called Lago Residencias. So they understood that uh, this is a neighborhood, this is a very problematic neighborhood with a lot of drug abuse, uh, a lot of prostitution, but also a bit of emerging tourism. So it's a very, very central neighborhood. So they could actually feel that there will be a, this kind of transformation in the neighborhood. They could feel that there will be tourism coming soon. So what they were trying to connect these two phenomena through through one building. So what did they do? They uh, hired, they rented this building, they renovated it uh, again with a lot of self-labor. They created this really beautiful uh, renovation with a ground floor uh, club and cultural center, first floor a hotel, second floor a hostel, third floor an artist residency. And they created a system in which, one of the few examples in Europe actually, where you have a tourism is channeled into a social project that gives employment for a lot of people. I, I'm, I'm there regularly, we work a lot with, with them. And uh, I can see the people working there. I can see the, the lady who comes from uh, Angola and she, she came to Portugal when she was seven. She never had papers in her life, so she never had a legal job, and they actually managed to hire her and, and get the papers for her for the first time in, in her life, practically. You know, she's 60, so she spent 53 years illegally with no papers, and now she works in a, in a, in a, in a, in a cafe, and she has a safe uh, job. And she's one of many people who come from homelessness, drug, etc. Et so this, this is a way to use a building to channel tourism money into uh, on the one hand, local environment and also a lot of local events. Uh, they are actually, in a way, a hub uh, of a cultural network of a lot of organizations in this uh, given Lisbon neighborhood. So they are actually leading the discussion of what should we do with this neighborhood, what is the future of Lisbon. Again, based on having a building that is also very strategically located, there's a big square in front. Uh, so this is actually very suitable to give visibility to these issues. Maybe very briefly, and then I, I, I see faces are falling slowly. So maybe, oh, so you can a little bit uh, mobilize yourself. Uh, maybe we need some light in the, in the back, I don't know. How you feel about that? I won't be very long, I promise. Uh, but another uh, project that it's, might be interesting to follow in, in Porto, I mean in, in, uh, in Portugal, which is, uh, which is a project that is uh, using, um, it's called Critical Concrete, it's run by a French guy who moved from Berlin to Porto, and he's very interested in, in social architecture, social building, and the point here is that he, he organizes every summer this two week, uh, two or three week uh, building camp, which is focusing on very banal renovating buildings of, of really, uh, really deprived uh, families. So in, in, in neighborhoods which have a lot of problems, families which live in very uh, unsustainable uh, conditions, and they bring 30 people, two weeks, three weeks, and they renovate the building from, from zero to, uh, well, it's, it's quite impressive what, what you can do in, in a few weeks. Why is it interesting in this context? It's because you mobilize a lot of resources. It's, uh, it's a lot of people who are actually willing to join this whole process because it's a learning experience. It's a lot of... They, they uh, experiment a lot with technology, technologies for insulation, for heating, which is usually a general problem in, in southern Europe, but uh, maybe except for Italy, uh, Spain and Portugal and Greece, you know, it's not really, they're not really prepared for, for heating. Somehow they always manage, you know, winter is short, we manage, but in the end it's, it, it can be a serious problem. So a lot of experimentation with technology and bringing a lot of resources, uh, human labor resources for a step-by-step -step social project. Now, uh, we talked about all these issues and I would like to change the scale before, before we finish. Uh, because I think it's, it's great to talk about uh, the scale of the building, but I think it's very, very interesting maybe to, to scale up to the neighborhood or to the city. So what can we do with all this uh, moving from the building to the, to the neighborhood or the city scale? And I would like to invite you to Madrid where again a, a very interesting architecture office called well it's, the architecture office is called SIC and they also they are also an association a little bit like us that is called uh, VIC uh, Vivero de Iniciativa Ciudadanas which means the greenhouse for uh, citizen initiatives who a few years ago they started to well they're, they're architects but they understood that the city of Madrid is, has been really built in the last years 
especially in the years of crisis where there's very little construction, uh, very much about uh, by civic initiatives, a lot of a uh, lot of projects that were based in the neighborhood, they created new spaces, they created new services, and they became very important actors of, of Madrid. Now, in, in, in a parenthesis, uh, well, how many are you, of you are familiar with Madrid? Uh, okay, do you know, some of you know the Campo de Sabada, which is a, a former, uh, I don't have an image here, but uh, it could be interesting. It's, it's very interesting because it's, um, it's uh, it was a, a kind of a sports complex, and uh, the municipality was trying to do a, a new sports complex. Except that in the middle of they demolished everything that was there. They started to build a new one, and then the crisis came, and there was the whole thing was you know half half finished, half abandoned, and nobody really you know it, it became a black spot in, in the people's minds, mind maps. So they 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 forgot that there there was this place. And then uh, a festival, uh, th there was a festival, and the group of architects called Exist, maybe you know, uh, they don't no longer exist, it was a French collective that was, we also had them in Budapest, we, uh, they, they, they're quite interesting because they were actually quite, uh, quite in, uh, influential in, in, in reactivating a lot of spaces actually in Europe somehow. They had this talent of understanding a situation where you put in uh, energy, you create a festivity, you create an event, you put an installation, you start to show people how they can use the space, you shut, start to open the, pe the people's eyes, how can they actually uh, uh, you know, get the, the possession of a, into, into their possession of a new, new space, a new community infrastructure. So they actually they were very good in, in, in spotting these places. For example, in, in uh, I didn't have a slide about this either, but in, uh, in the northern suburbs of Paris, in Saint-Denis, uh, they rented out a, a like 6,000 square meter building for one year to open some studios, some activities. In an office building that was planned to be demolished one year later, uh, but somehow they became so successful in actually connecting with the neighborhood, creating a lot of jobs uh, for the neighborhood and also making their project very visible that the building became part of the, the long-term plan for the neighborhood. So it was no longer planned to be demolished, it is actually there, it's called Swiss Bay and it's actually a very successful uh, project now, hosting a lot of artist studios but also social projects etc. Et coming from uh, a, a group of architects who started renting a, a building. No? So the same thing happened here that uh, they came to this, uh, they came to this, uh, um, this you know, no man's land in the middle of the city that was abandoned, that was uh, you know, half finished, and they they made an installation in this big uh, square. It's the Metro La Latina, if if you know that. Uh, it's right from the, you get out of the Metro and you see this big uh, the fence, and behind the fence there's this, all this thing. So they, they made an installation, temporary installation, and all the neighborhood realized, that, wow, we had this place we forgot about. It's been here close for five years, we forgot about this, and here we go. We have now access for this festival, and maybe we could actually use this for the long term. So they occupied some neighborhood associations, occupied this area, they made a deal with the municipality, and I think by now, for, for probably six years, they've been running. It's a, it's a, neighborhood associations that maintain the, the space. Uh, it's a lot of sports activities, a lot of concerts, etc. Et so it is another community-run space which is opened up by an architect intervention. But going back to Madrid in general and uh, Riviera de Iniciativa Ciudadana, so they started to un understanding all these dynamics, they started to map who's doing what in the city. So they started to do this, I think it's really beautiful fancy maps uh, which have a very special, uh, I don't know if I, no? Anyway, so they, they have all this typology of, uh, of, of well, it's, it's very architectural, so uh, in a way uh, creating a diff, you know, very specific code system for understanding space and understanding who's doing what. So they built up this system of, of indicators uh, or, or indications of every shape means something, every color means something. Uh, all the, the, the icons inside mean something, so they created the system for themselves to understand who, who are the citizen act, you know, initiatives in, in Madrid. Madrid is a big city with a lot of citizen initiatives. And they approached the, 
the city of Madrid that, look, we understood that there's some of these neighborhoods have some really interesting patterns. We have Vallecas, which has a lot of organizations that deal with uh, sustainable mobility. Uh, Villa Verde, there's a lot of things about food because it's close to the fields, but it's close, also close to the, the large scale food markets. Uh, that's it, that's it there. So they joined the city and they, uh, they did a big application for a 5 million euro uh, European funding that is called uh, Urban Innovative Actions. And they, they created a proposal which brings together all of these organizations in some buildings, some publicly owned buildings that uh, this, uh, they propose a new design, they propose to repurpose all these buildings in a way to create hubs for all these activities like uh, in Vallecas, there's this building that they're building from scratch uh, that is uh, hosting a lot of NGOs, a lot of social enterprises, a lot of organizations that are active in the neighborhood in the topic of mobility. So it's kind of a space where you can experiment, you can exchange a lot of things, and the city helps you a lot and all the other organizations are helping you a lot. So the whole point is that you have, an, you have a vision of, a, of the city, you have a vision of what are the activities that are present, you create a vision of uh, uh, how can you connect them? How can you, you know, help them to be stronger together? To join them into like clusters uh, uh, or or hubs, and then you actually produce an architecture project that will accommodate all these all these projects. So it's been running for two years now. I think some of the buildings are already ready. If you're in Madrid, I think it's quite interesting because it's a, it's an architecture project, but it's also a project of you know channeling dynamics together. Uh, in a way that gives a lot of jobs, uh, you know, uh, solves a lot of social issues as well. Um, but also, we can talk about uh, you know citywide governance in, in other cities as well. Uh, and also, we I think some cities in Europe have been experimenting quite a bit with uh, with, with with governance models. For example, how can you let's say there's a public building. Uh, but you don't want to create a completely top-down structure, you don't want to create a, a building in which uh, a municipality runs the whole thing, because you understand as a municipality that uh, actually people who are embedded in local communities, professionals, they have a much better local knowledge, they have better co connections with different social groups, with communities, so you want to create a shared governance in which you still have a say as a municipality, uh, but you involve a lot of other people, a lot of other organizations into this uh, discussion. You know? So this is what governance means in its scale. Like how do you govern together a building? And I think Turin in the last years has been very active in, in developing very innovative governance models. Like this is a, a form of farm uh, house that was uh, the outside of the city and by now it's actually in the city because the city grew around it. Uh, it is a, a neighborhood that is quite problematic, so it needs a lot of social services. A lot of NGOs are very active, a lot of social enterprises are very active in, in involving the local community. So they came up with this governance structure, which uh, uh, is kind of a board, uh, curatorial board, which involves some people from the municipality, but also uh, some people that represent the 150 associations that are involved in the area, involved in the territory. For example, you have a social enterprise that runs uh, the restaurant where you, you go there, you order something and it might be that you receive something else, but you're very flexible about this because you see that actually you, you help uh, creating jobs that are otherwise, uh, you know, for people who otherwise have really uh, big, uh, big difficulties in having jobs. So, you know, you go there with a, with a social spirit and also yeah, this is a, a way to, uh, you know, ease a lot of social problems in these neighborhoods. And then Turin has a lot of other buildings, like a former bathhouse, which also functions in the same way, uh, that is co-managed by the city and uh, associations locally. And then, uh, then this is the new thing, that all these buildings are actually creating a city-wide network of, of uh, spaces that also come together in a city-wide discussion and governance uh, structure, where they decide together about how should we move uh, ahead together how should we think about these spaces? What kind of services does the city need? What can we contribute uh, with this? And of course, these are all projects that are very much embedded in their neighborhoods. They, you know, there was very interesting architectural renovations in these buildings. They work a lot with uh, different kinds of organizations around, and they are also very active on the level of the city. 
maybe I will, I will, uh, uh, maybe I, I can still speak a few, a few words about this because it's another interesting governance model on the city scale. If you go to Bremen, actually we're not so far from Bremen now. It's another Hansa, Hansa city. So Bremen uh, has been dealing a lot with empty buildings and they created a very interesting structure for to deal with empty buildings. It's a post-industrial city, it's lost uh, you know, a big part of its industry. It's a harbor city, it's lost a big part of its harbor activities for Hamburg, for Rotterdam, for Naples, for other uh, cities. And uh, it, it has a lot of empty buildings and even big areas. So they thought again, they thought that we as a municipality, we might not be the right people to really manage this whole thing. We don't have a very good access to uh, access to civil society and, and uh, you know the creative uh, creative sector. So maybe we want to have an intermediary organization that is called Zwischenzeiten uh, Talent, etc. That could mediate a little bit between city organizations and the creative sector. ZZZ is an organization that is run by a group of architects um, that is exactly filling this mediator role. So it's another, another role for architects to mediate, to understand what uh, a given building can do, who are the people who in the city needs uh, these kind of spaces. Like I showed you maybe in the beginning, I showed you a, a, a slide with a, I didn't elaborate. Uh, when I told about uh, accessing, uh, architects can help uh, initiatives access spaces. There was this very high building with uh, the guy juggling. Mm -hmm. And this is, for example, we, we opened this in, in, in Budapest for an organization that is doing circus for uh, hyperactive children because they, circus is very good for concentration. It's, it helps hyperactive children to concentrate. They learn how to learn. It's a very interesting intervention. But this needs very high buildings, but they don't have a lot of money, so it needs very high buildings which are very tight. They're very small floor plan with very high building. So you need an architect, you know, you need an architectural look into understanding what can this building serve, who, uh, what, uh, what kind of building these people would need. So this is exactly what they do. So they have a, a regular, uh, regular meetings and regular discussion with, on the one hand, all kinds of departments of the city and all kinds of stakeholders like real estate owners association, creative uh, sector, da, da, da. So this allows a constant flow of information for them that they understand that, for example, this part of the port will be empty from next year. Oh, we start organizing a community. We understand what kind of architecture interventions we need, how much money this would take, and we organize the whole process. So again, we talk about architects who go one step beyond designing, and they start also organizing the process, the program, and the whole process of building up a project around. And maybe here I will really run. I don't know how much time do I have. Uh, should I slowly? Anyway, I, I can talk about this. I love this, this uh, uh, project as well. And we're almost in the end. So we're again in, 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 in a place. Uh, we're again in Lisbon. And we're in a, in a, in a logic of uh, creating, uh, again, giving, uh, uh, creating possibilities for community projects in very complicated neighborhoods. This is a map of the, the worst, uh, the most complicated neighborhoods of Lisbon. Uh, and there's a special funding model uh, organized by the municipality of Lisbon that gives uh, very targeted funding for, like seed funding, for at least two or three organizations in one neighborhood who would create a long-term social projects. And most of these projects are actually spaces, uh, like this was uh, uh, a small you know, empty building which became with, with uh, actually a really nice architecture of this uh, uh, renovated this and turned it into a small cultural uh, center, which also hosts a restaurant that uh, you know, uses a bit of tourist money to create uh, social functions. It has also you know, a kitchen for people who cannot afford to, to eat. So again, mixing a little bit, mixing a little bit uh, tourist money with uh, social services, and again with a very important role for architects. Also, the the hotel hostel that I showed you before, this was also created partly in this program, again, with a very strong architect uh, uh, involvement, understanding what are the empty buildings in the neighborhood, how can we use the seed funding actually to build a project that will be viable on the long term, who are the communities we can draw in, who can actually feed this building with some meaning. So I think these are really, and now we have, as, as I show you, a series of, uh, well, a series of 
building a series of spaces in this one which were built up in this logic with the uh, engaged architectural offices. Now getting to the very end, maybe I'm not going into details about how all this thinking, all this thinking of uh, creating a governance system for uh, to share responsibilities and resources between municipalities, uh, professionals like architects and all kinds of civic initiatives. There has been a lot of thinking in, in for example, Bologna, which built its uh, uh, commons regulation, uh, which is a kind of a legal framework which allows uh, citizens to access uh, abandoned, uh, empty buildings or empty spaces. Uh, or Ghent, which has a common transition strategy, which brings together all kinds of people who work in sustainable transition and, uh, and tries to give them you know, different kinds of opportunities again to spaces. So there's a lot of thinking on the city scale how to, uh, how to apply all these principles, all these ideas in policies and, and legislations. And of course, many of these, uh, these issues are it's great, it's, it, it's great that Berlin has this, it's great that Rotterdam has this, but you know, we're not always in Berlin or Rotterdam, we're not always in Lisbon or Barcelona. So what happens in other, other cities? So this is what we've been trying to do in the last uh, years a lot. How can, we, how can we help some models, some initiatives, some ideas, some principles to, to uh, try in other places to move, to transfer some of these, uh, these uh, these formats in other places, so for example, and then we met, of course, as the title says, we met a lot of difficulties uh, in this process. We worked uh, about a year on, uh, in Rome, for example, in this area, which is a, was a kind of an abandoned uh, industrial area very close to the Tiburtina station, which some of you might know it's actually, it's the biggest uh, train station, it's even bigger than Termini. Uh, uh, not well, not in the very center, but it's still in a very strategic location. It's right next to this uh, this uh, station, and it was uh, an industrial area which hosted companies that were renovating the night uh, wagons of trains. Uh, the company went bankrupt in the crisis. Uh, some of the former workers, together with a lot of uh, uh, neighborhood organizations, they occupied the area, they started to do their own activities like uh, as small private companies actually, they were doing the same things, renovating things. Uh, but then uh, the, the area was managed by a bankruptcy court and then we spent uh, actually a year trying to help this community to actually uh, access to the ownership of this whole, uh, whole uh, area, which was actually a fantastic deal because we could have bought this area for 2 million euros. 2 million, two million euros you pay for a, a better apartment in the center of Rome, uh, not for a 20,000 square meter area next to the, one of the big, most important stations. Uh, so this could have been a fantastic opportunity, uh, except that with such a precarious uh, community, with the people who are, in a way, they're all stuck to their everyday uh, life. They don't see themselves in five years or 10 years. It's not like in Berlin. Many people really have their plans for, we'll be there for the next uh, 20 years, we can invest, you know, we can become owners, we can, we can invest in long-term uh, ownership, long-term presence. So this was a very big conflict between different people in, in this community. In the end, actually, a, a bank came and just bought it for 2 million euros and, uh, and they are being uh, now replaced and they will have a smaller place uh, for actually very, quite high rent. So, we understood how, you know, transferring some principles from one area to another, it's not very easy. But what we are doing now uh, is we started a few months ago, we started a big project uh, called Open Heritage, where with a lot of organizations across Europe, for example, some of the foundations that I showed you that work on putting properties off the speculation, some of the crowdfunding platforms, uh, some universities, some developers, uh, <coughs> some architecture offices, we're working on uh, trying to understand what, how can we transfer uh, some of these models to different uh, places. Uh, a little bit, how can we, uh, you know, implement the idea of the solidarity fund, maybe beyond borders, maybe, uh, let's say, I'm working now a lot with the municipality of Athens. Athens is forced to sell everything. You know, the, the port of Pyrrhus was sold to uh, Chinese owners. Uh, all buildings are being sold, and, and this is a really pity. Could we, could we mobilize a bit of European money? Could we mobilize civ civic money in Europe to save some of these buildings? And Athens is actually booming. Athens in 
five years will be, everything will cost three times as much as today. So this is a very safe investment. Can we create a structure to, can we create a legal structure in Athens that can accommodate this kind of investment uh, that will not be a speculation project, but will be a, a project to save some of these buildings, some of these infrastructures for the public good, for public use, for the long term. If the state is not able, because it's under you know, austerity pressure, or the city is not able, because there's very little competence, no? can we try to uh, apply these principles across borders? Can we also try to mobilize a bit of European money? There's a lot of European investment going into completely nonsense things. I'm from, from Budapest, although I live most of the time in Rome. You can see both of them. I mean, Budapest, uh, in Hungary, we're building stadiums uh, in uh, villages that have 1,000 people. We're building stadiums for 4,000 people, which will never be used. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of EU funding going to nonsense. Uh, this will never get back. It's it's really bad investment. The same thing in Rome. There's so many big star architecture projects that were abandoned in the, the crisis. Now they're trying to retrofit them. So that at least we can use the fantastic swimming pool of Calatrava. At least we can use it for something. At least for something. At, at least it could be a square or something. So how can we rethink a little bit of investment, reinvestment of public money, of European money, into projects where there are real communities behind who are actually willing to carry these projects uh, ahead for the next 10 years. And also, how can we help some of these initiatives, but also the professionals who are around, including architects, to be a bit more aware of the whole financial dimension, the whole economic dimension of uh, these spaces. And in general, uh, you know, create a bit more financial and economic literacy about all these issues. So many of these stories that I was telling you, it's, uh, it's also, you can find them on a a platform that we run that is called Cooperative City. It's cooperativecity.org. This is kind of our, my organization's travel diary because we work with a lot of organizations across Europe. We meet a lot of very interesting projects, municipalities, uh, developments, and we try to a little bit document this and, and we try to tell these stories as well because we also understand that uh, very often there's very little visibility of, uh, of community-run uh, urban development projects. Very often they cannot really tell their stories, so often this website is also used that many organizations actually use these uh, interviews or these articles as their own references. Uh, somebody asks, what are you doing? They, they send a link to here, this is what we do, because somehow we as an external eye, but still partners working together, we can tell their stories sometimes a bit more, uh, more efficient. So this is a little bit the topic I wanted to address here. Uh, you can always reach us uh, uh, on these emails as well. And I'm happy to discuss. Uh, I hope there's some relevance for, for you architects. Uh, our one urban planner already left the room, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we have zero, zero social scientists and economists, so we will have to have an architectural discussion about all this. Uh, so <coughs> you described these new models and initiatives of, of cooperating with funding and ownership and governance. <coughs> and you described them mainly from the positive viewpoint. You agree that there are a lot of positive sides, but usually most of the things also have some potential negative sides, especially when these kinds of new models get started and they get kind of implemented in the large scale and, and with the widespread. So I'm curious if you have kind of analyzed also the potential long-term negative consequences and how to avoid or, or minimize them. Yeah, so we, we emphasize the positive sides because it's, mm -hmm. it's in a way it's an advocacy project. So it's seen in very many different contexts how that civic tissue, that civic infrastructure that is built up in the gaps of the state. I mean, in many, I go to Helsinki, you know, there's no real need for these initiatives. It's, you know, it's nice, it's, everything works, it's great. Even Vienna, you know, the city is trying to push. The city is, is understanding now that politics is changing, we might not be there forever. Sorry, it's, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. here. So the city is pushing that, come on, you should do something. I know that we are really good in a most livable city, 
you should start building your own projects because you know we we won't be here forever, and 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 we we're afraid that uh, you know if you're so used to having everything top down, then uh, there's an FPO government that takes over Vienna, then you know everything will disappear. Uh, this is what Gent's doing actually. Gent is preparing for for elections and they say that look all the civic infrastructure that we helped creating they have to become more independent they have to be sustainable without us because this is very important for the city and they should not depend on us so advocacy yes yeah, so we do we do the advocacy part and i think uh, the negative consequences i mean there will be a lot of projects that are simply not feasible no? a lot of projects it's really in the end, in a development project like this, everything depends on how much things cost, how, what kind of loan can you take, uh, what kind of interest do you get, what kind of guarantees do you have, can you create, uh, can one group really carry on? It's always very personal, unlike a professional developer. Professional developers will have professionals who have to do their jobs uh, towards certain objectives. In this kind of project, it's always a lot of people who are personally involved, it's the life stories, they spend 20 hours a day, they get burned down. So all these kind of things that are there. But what's important is that uh, the more and more organizations, and we try to help with this, but also there are the foundations, for example, that uh, put a lot of energy into helping to create the dynamics with these organizations and also the economic and financial models within these organizations that will help them actually survive. So they will sit down and they will spend weeks, like what we did with the, in Rome and in other places, spend weeks uh, understanding what are the weak points, what are the what are the points when the whole thing can fail, and how can we you know understand how can how can we avoid this kind of failure? So I think there's a lot of work. Nobody's going to do it alone. But there's a lot of more and more structures that would help you. Uh, following the whole project and, and uh, you know in with with the difference from a, a traditional mortgage or, or, or a project where you have a, a loan in exchange for a property you know, is that ultimately a, a bank will be interested in, in taking your property this is this is in the end this is the equation and in, in this these cases nobody is interested in everybody's interested in keeping your project running and helping you of course, nobody wants to push it, put in more money because that's not sustainable. Because there is a big network of, of, of spaces that, in a way, feed this shared solidarity funds. So if, if you help one too much, then you know this is from the other's own resources. But nobody's interested in making you fail, and that's a very big difference. The traditional finance, especially with the, you know predatory loans that we saw in the crisis, uh, having a very important role. They are very opposing interests, in yeah. and that's somehow. Until recently, we were really lucky in those kind of financial structures, ethical banks, organizations that are really interested in having your projects in the run. But those um, social structures and community-based decision making. Uh, I'm wondering how it feels like being an architect there. Instead of having a one client, you would have like the whole community, maybe not even having their free for point of departure that will mm -hmm. define. And then you get this bunch of people as your, I mean, let's say you start from the beginning or you're renovating something. And how, how, do you, how do you act as an architect? Or have you seen a process of constructing something aside where an architect has a client of 100 people or 1,000 people? Yeah. I think it's it's much more listening than, than, than bringing your, your ideas. And I, I can just tell you, for example, what my friend from Atelier Mob, he, he tells that, for example, in the whole uh, uh, reconstruction pro this is not about being a, building a financial, innovative financial model, it's about reconstruction of the fire. What he says is that uh, they spent a lot of time, you know, organizing meetings, organizing you know, discussions, and really trying to understand what people are actually aiming at, what kind of, uh, what kind of homes do they imagine. And, and they ended up, in a way, they ended up building, you know, in a way, much better quality, because they really understood where is the, what are the things that people really need, what are the, the places where you need a higher quality, and what are the things that, in the end, are not so important. So they actually, when, when he describes, they're the only architecture office which is not under attack for 
practically spending too much money on the, the buildings because they were really optimizing what, what is needed for, for these, uh, these families. And also they, they, are the, they created the buildings that are actually the most, most liked because it's, it's a very time consuming thing. You have to spend a lot of time uh, together with, uh, with that. And again, I mean, the architect might not be the, in these cases, like I can, I can give you the example, for example, of a, there's a really nice market hall in, uh, in Bratislava. Maybe some of you have been there. And, and I'm just, just a little bit of who, what does the architect do in that process, no? And, uh, and the city of Bratislava was practically producing a lot of deficits. It was a market hall that was dying. Nothing really uh, happened. It really created a lot of deficits. It closed down, and then the, uh, an NGO with what they like to say is that with diff 11 different competences, they, 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 uh, they approached the city that we could actually run this as a, as a, as a market. Market and also something else. And two of these people are, are architects, and they, what they were working on, they were really, they were developing the whole spatial concept, they were developing the whole renovation concept, but then they had all the other competences of the, the financial guy, the legal guy, the community organizer guy, the girls, the, uh, the person who was organizing parties you know, for 20 years, so the, the person who can outreach to private companies to make events. So, you know, all these competences in a way added together, and the architects uh, have a specific role in this. Except that in, in many cases, the architects are the catalyst of the whole thing. In this case, not necessarily. But uh, I, I guess it's a lot of listening, it's a lot of uh, coordination, it's a lot of uh, meetings. <coughs> yeah. uh, I want to ask. <coughs> uh, so we talk about social uh, uh, activities and, and to, to recreate spaces. This is one side. Another side is the investors and specul speculations. It's like a two antagonistic structures, or it's a how it's from your point. Maybe there is so somebody wants to make money, mm -hmm. make money and live. Somebody wants to make a, create spaces for people. So this is two two different uh, approaches, two different approaches to life. Or or, or I think, I mean, we, we can say it like this, you know, in a way we can say it, that the space can serve, you know, I, mean, I don't want to enter into that kind of uh, terminology, but it can be a, you know, um, the exchange value or it can be the use value you know, in the end. But again, you know, without finance, you cannot do anything without finance. The, the shop, the corner shop, and because that's also finance. So it's, I think it's more like there are many different finance, and there are many different uh, ways of, of developing things. And uh, the kind of development which works with uh, uh, either a fictive community, we don't really know what they want, but we, we kind of predict, and uh, or especially we, we know that nobody's ever going to live here. It's a, it's, it's a stock that somebody will buy and resell. You know, that's not creating a lot of public good. It makes a lot of money, but it's not really, it's, it's a very harmful thing for, for the cities. And I think there's more and more, very, very often people who come from banking and people who are really disappointed with banking and they understand their own role in the crisis, for example, who, who, who are building up uh, new banks, new structures, like Stiftung Trias was created by somebody who comes from a bank. So they have all the financial knowledge, but they, they understand that you can do it a bit differently. Mm -hmm. You can generate revenue, you have to generate revenue. The, all these places, they, they have to generate revenue. But the whole model of, of the loan, the whole model of financing is built in a way that you don't have to, you don't have to compromise your activities in order to generate revenue, but it is built in the whole model. And you know, eventually, also, it's not, uh, you, you can have a, a decent life and a decent salary, but you're not going to become rich because of this one certain building. And I think it's still acceptable. And it's, it's, it's about different visions of uh, life and what you want to achieve. A little bit projected into, into architecture or, or development. But I think, for example, the, the, in, in Bratislava, it's a quite interesting story because uh, it's a market hall that uh, uh, the whole construction is that uh, the NGO has to put every month 10,000 euro in the renovation of the, the building. 
which is a lot of money, but they created a very unique uh, vibe, a unique aura to the building, which became the most wanted uh, event space for all private big companies. So you you can you can rent the space for one night for eight thousand euros. So in the end, in September, November, October, November, you have a lot of events, and that covers years ahead all the renovation costs that you have. You don't pay a rent, but you have to pay this ten thousand euro a month. But you uh, you are the for years ahead you can produce that, and this allows you to open also because your structure you cannot take uh, profits as individuals. Yeah, uh, you have to reinvest in your activities. So actually, you can create a lot of projects that have a social value in that uh, space because you have a lot of available money. So somehow, this is why I also mentioned a little bit the legal frameworks. There are a lot of legal frameworks which are created. Uh, in order to, that you cannot take out private profits because this is the whole spirit that we can have a decent life, we can have a very good salary, but the point is to reinvest this profit into something else. And also, especially when you have a uh, you know, uh, community effort behind uh, a lot of resources mobilized, so public money or public uh, space, public assets, I think it's a fair thing that. Uh, they can operate in a way that uh, people can have a decent life, people can have a decent salary, but the profit is reinvested in uh, other spaces. I mean, I see in Hungary so much uh, public-private cooperation where so much money is disappearing in, in private profit that it's just crazy. The economy is doing well now, and in two years, I think everything will collapse. More questions? Um, are you of any related topics? Um. Yeah. I would like to ask about the role and meaning of communities. In our region, it is in both the socialism region, where we come to have yeah. strong and communities, area-based communities with long-term investment rates. And we know your topics about uh, community ownership and community finance actually is ground on area-based communities that need it. And other forms, we know that people in Europe are going to be more mobile, more flexible, they are more on place to place because of the very nice opportunities for job and change, uh, living space and places. Could you feel in your, from your experience that this mobility, which is quite common in Europe and, and which is going to be developed, are going to, uh, this, this trend is going to impact to community building and community long-term in interest which is key, key factor for uh, this country. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very interesting question. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, yes, community, so uh, I, I uh, spent <coughs> in Budapest, which is also a post-communist uh, city, I spent seven years moderating a Facebook group of, uh, of my neighborhood, and uh, well, it was not very easy. <laughs> and, but then we had the base-based base community, very strong, I mean, we had uh, 2,000 people in the group, very active, but not everybody thought the same things, of course. So uh, I understand that, there, and also, in our case, I think solidarity, the whole idea of solidarity, as you can see in, in the Hungarian uh, political situation, solidarity is not the strongest value of individuals either, and, and you could feel this on uh, in the, in the local level as well. I think it's, it's uh, in, in many cases, uh, that kind of local solidarity is, there's, there's a long tradition of that. So uh, in many cities, like, uh, like in, in Spanish cities and Italian cities, there were moments of history. I mean, not even mentioning Barcelona, which is 100 years of history of self-organization. But even Rome, for example, in the 90s, uh, there were a lot of structures created for, for local uh, decision making, uh, like they, they're called neighborhood committees. And they have a symbolic role, but they are a forum for discussing the, the interests of the interest of, 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 of the neighborhood. And of course, all these these local communities have different trajectories. So my, my neighborhood committee in, in, in Rome, for example, is dominated by 
practically one person who has a very specific agenda and, and they hit the other neighborhood committee because it's a bit more entrepreneurial. So it's, it's, it's very arbitrary in the end where these places develop. But I think if, if s such a structure is open enough, uh, I mean, I, I'm a regular participant in, in this neighborhood's life, even if I'm not from Rome, and it took me years to understand what are the questions and the language. Uh, the whole, but but, uh, but uh, I think if, if, if a structure like this is open enough, then it, it allows people to maintain, to keep it diverse, keep it uh, dynamic as well. Uh, on the other hand, I, I see that uh, the lack of this kind of, uh, of, 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 uh, of organization, the lack of forums for discussion, I think this, this is a very, very big disadvantage of, of the European cities. And I think it's never too late to, to, to create this kind of forums, to, to create an informed discussion. No? I think especially in Riga now, I think there's quite a bit of uh, effort put in from different sides to create uh, local NGOs that are collecting uh, neighborhoods, but people from a neighborhood, uh, help them to share ideas. Uh, so I think that's, that, that's, a, that's a good thing. So you can, as a city, you can help that. As, a, as, a, as an architect, actually, I, for example, I, 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 I worked in New York for the city hall. And for example, I worked a lot on, we went a lot for community boards. And it's not neighborhood committee, it's a community board. Every district has a community board. Which is, uh, which is practically, they cannot really block legal things, but they can put a lot of pressure. So some neighborhood, some community boards are very powerful. Like uh, in, in, in richer areas, you have people in community boards who are very powerful people, and they can put a lot of pressure on what should happen. And then architects are very important of this, this, this whole process because, um, because architects will be the people who will create, for example, alternative plans. So all these community boards have the instruments since the 70s to produce their own plans. So for example, there's a development plan for an area. A, the, the community board says that we don't like this plan, we want to have another plan, and they can produce their own thing. This goes in front of the city council. And then, then that, you know, it, they can still refuse that, or they can vote for it. And architects will be the people who actually channel the community ideas with a lot of discussion, a lot of meetings, a lot of listening into actually a physical plan. And there's also like the local architecture chambers, they do a lot of campaigns, to join your community board, help your community. Board. So I think this is a very imp important thing to engage professionals, to engage people who are, who live there maybe, but professionals. Our neighborhood uh, group, for example, we had a lot of architects in the beginning. They were very active, we had a lot of meetings, we had a lot of plans that we did a lot for mobility, uh, for the public space, you know. and then some, some issues took over, and then the rest of the last six years out of the seven years was about moderating between two different, uh, three different positions about homeless people, about, uh, about nightlife and, and street cleanness. So this is a question, can you create a constructive local community that goes towards one goal? Or, or you create uh, a community <coughs> of uh, reaction, reactionaries that uh, can block and, uh, things. I don't know. It's, it's a complicated thing. But again, many of these projects, you, it's not necessarily that you live in a neighborhood, but you, you, are, you have maybe a community of interest, so not necessarily a place-based community, community of interest that looks for its own facilities, looks for its own you know, places or spaces. And, and they would look for spaces and they would develop house and for example in, a, in, in the case of Bratislava it's in the middle of the city so it's practically everybody can relate to but in many cases it's more you know in, in some given neighborhoods so that will have more neighborhood effect and more more work in the neighborhood uh, organization and the other thing about mobility I think it's also very interesting because maybe what we lose when we when we when we move to other places and, and but this is up to if we can be great or not we, we lose a lot of the local civic issue, understanding of the questions. Um, we lose a lot of this knowledge, but this knowledge can be recreated in, in a new place. Also, we lose something that is very important, that how can we, for example, our economic choices, how can we use our economic choices to serve some kind of interest instead of another kind of interest? Can we, if I, if I buy every, every week, if I buy my food in this shop instead of that shop, uh, do I help some kind of community or some people? Do I 
have a job to survive. If I buy in this bookshop instead of Amazon, uh, do I contribute to a, a healthier local economy? Maybe. So I think that all these choices that we, we need to be aware of, and we're very rarely aware of, uh, to be honest. And this is something that maybe in our own home we're, we're more conscious about how we empower certain businesses, certain situations. And when we go to a new city, we might be a bit isolated, we might be a bit less conscious about it. But again, I think uh, I was also in, in, in many dif different cities, I actually well, was quite active in, uh, in uh, neighborhood committees, and, and these structures can be actually quite open. So you have to find your ways into that, and then you can contribute to that. And, uh, <coughs> but again, but, but the other thing is also, and I was thinking about this, uh, so another dimension of this question is that, of course, like now everybody goes to Lisbon, no? Everybody puts another layer of pressure on the local housing system. Uh, everybody, you know, we have driving up the prices, we, we engage in short-term accommodation, etc. So also, there's a lot of uh, ways that the more you uh, leave your original context behind, the more you forced into those economically really more complicated, more uh, you know, more demanding, and also maybe more harmful situations. So there's a whole industry in, in, in the U.S. for people who are who would be moving between houses. So you, I think, you pay uh, maybe three thousand dollars. No, actually five or even more thousand dollars a month, which is a good apartment in anywhere in, in the U.S. But like this, you get a <coughs> complex set of services. You, you can choose between 20 cities. You go wherever you want. I think it's called a relief. So this is the whole name of the concept. So you get a full package. You have a membership, and you go to, to wherever you want, and you can use this kind of system, which is which is you know great from the side of the user, and it's very bad from the side of the local community because in the end you will have. You have people who would pay five thousand dollars for a room in a, in a in a house, which will have a lot of you know fun and a lot of you know, things, a lot of services, but that is definitely pushing out people who can only pay let's say two thousand dollars, which is already a lot. So they're all. I mean, I think the real estate industry is in a, in a way is, is about minimalizing the surface and the time that you can you can valorize. No, it's all about. You have a lot of startups that are. You, you have a restaurant and it's not used during the day, only in the evening, then we make a co working space and we maximize even, even that moment. Or, of course, Airbnb is about that as well. No? You have a spare room, you, you can maximize the, the turnover. Uh, you, can, you have an apartment, you can break it into three smaller apartments, you maximize. So I think it's a very scary thing uh, because, because the smaller you go into, the more you can you can uh, you can uh, accelerate how revenue works. The smaller time unit and the smaller space unit, and in a way, mobility and nomad nomadism is serving actually this. So I think maybe we need alternative structures for this as well. For example, Airbnb has its own alternative now being built, which is called Fairbnb. Which is the whole idea is that you, I mean, it's not working yet, but it's 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 already uh, there's a network of organizations that are trying to build this up where. You don't pay your profits, well, your commission to California, to a, a company that doesn't really pay tax anywhere. You, your commission goes into a social project that helps locally. You, you don't go to places which are owned by a, an organization that owns you know, 200 apartments that they took out of the housing market and operate as a short-term accommodation, but you go to places where maybe somebody has a spare room and that person needs this revenue for, you know, for a normal life. So this kind of choices and, and without alternatives, it's very difficult to, uh, this is what I always say when I go to events, where it's, it's against tourism, against all, and you know, tourism can bring a lot of good things, but you, you need alternatives and then you can use your money to, to support those kind of things. It was a long answer and didn't even answer, but uh, that's all I can say. But isn't it a bit scary that it could uh, produce some kind of new model of business or model of developing, like if you are using some kind of alternative way of thinking to real estate? I mean, this is what Silicon Valley is always. 
five years ahead, and it's always, you know, expecting the most innovative ideas and, and putting them into, into practice. And, and when with Airbnb, it also arrived to to use that. And, uh, and of course, of course, uh, all ideas will appear in, in the market in an expected way, and, and I think we need, we need alternatives. I mean, these models were private profit is excluded, they will not be. That's the whole, whole challenge that uh, somehow we need to create legal frameworks that uh, help you, uh, force, forces you to stay, let's say, um, stay fiddle, stay honest to the original intentions, and also that, in a way, uh, limit your own uh, personal uh, individualism, in a way. And you know, there, there are ways to do this. There are legal forms that were created maybe a hundred years ago exactly against this kind of thing. We're losing the yeah. audience. <laughs> 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 we were hoping that the Austrian reception would come up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why not go to Austria? So <laughs> enjoy <laughs> Austrian embassies. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you very much.